Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for joining us for this healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We're going to do our best to educate and inspire you right here on Facebook and on YouTube. On tap today, Dr. Neil Barnard is here with the latest on how the coronavirus is being transmitted. We're talking about elevators, being outside the wind, face-to-face -face masks, everything you need to know to stay safe amid a growing tsunami of new cases. Dr. Barnard, can't wait to catch up with you, sir. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. I can't wait to share it. Also today, what we eat matters now more than ever. Powerful words from a leading health publication that is now promoting the idea of fighting COVID-19 by eating more plants and less meat. We'll discuss with dietitian Susan Levin. Susan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chuck. And as always, we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag. Dr. Barnard will be answering one of your questions. So go ahead. If you have one, post that in the comment section. Right now, we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. But first, let's get you caught up with what is happening in the world. Here are your health headlines for Monday, July 20th, 2020. There is no relief from the relentless coronavirus surge over the weekend. More than 130,000 new cases coming in over the last four 48 hours, bringing the total number to more than three or close to 3.8 million and pushing hospitals to their limit in the hardest hit states. More than 100 hospitals now in Florida out of ICU beds as the state remains the epicenter for COVID-19 here in the states. And meanwhile, other states are also setting single day records on Sunday and nine states reporting now a 40% spike in COVID related deaths over the past week. And nationwide fatalities have jumped 54% over the last two weeks, with the death toll now surpassing 140,000. In Alaska, 85 members on board a commercial fishing vessel have tested positive for the coronavirus, making it the latest fishing boat to have an outbreak among crew members. A number of smaller communities in the state had lobbied for the fishing season to be canceled over concerns. Their hospitals were ill-equipped to handle such a surge in cases. The Washington Post reports this particular ship had to be rerouted to Anchorage because its original destination had just one health clinic. And finally, in sports, the fastest vegan on four wheels continues to tear up the racetrack. Lewis Hamilton dominated Sunday's Hungarian Grand Prix to cruise to an easy victory, marking the eighth time he's captured the checkered flag at the event, also tying a record for most wins by a Formula One driver at a single Grand Prix. Congratulations, Mr. Hamilton. Let's switch gears now. As Hamilton was racing to victory, the coronavirus continued to race its way to new heights. The spread pedaled to the metal with no letting up across the country. So what exactly is driving this spread? There is now a renewed focus on determining how it is that we become infected and how easily someone who has it can pass it on. With a look at the newest data, Dr. Neil Barnard is here. Dr. Barnard, here's the situation. 37 states plus the district and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, they're all seeing an increase in both uh, new cases and in many places, a surge in deaths as well. What is happening here? How, I think a lot of people still just aren't really sure how it's being transmitted so quickly. Right. Um, those are crucial questions. Uh, we are not winning this battle collectively as, as a nation or, or globally, I have to say. You do see some places where things are getting better. But um, overall, the picture is one where the, the exit of this virus is slower than had been predicted. And that's certainly true here in the US. So it raises the question of what can you do about it? Um, and how are people getting it? Uh, if you walk into a room and somebody had been there and they were breathing out the virus, is it in the air? Are you gonna catch it that way? Or is it only if somebody sneezes right in front of you? Uh, does a mask help? Doesn't it help? There was a, a good article that just came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association just last week. And I wanna share the findings with you. But first of all, a little bit of, ba little bit of background. Here you are. Uh, this is a person who, let's say they got the virus and they cough it out um, in a big, Rest, what we call a respiratory droplet. Uh, that means it's a mixture of moisture and some virus in there, but it's heavy. So it falls to the ground, hopefully within six feet. But the question is, are there other particles 
that are smaller, that can become sort of airborne, and they don't settle to the ground, and we're going to call them aerosols. There's been a lot of debate back and forth about these two possibilities, and it's really important. Uh, the droplets, that's really what uh, will transmit a flu or a cold. And the aerosols, that's uh, measles or chicken box, chicken pox or tuberculosis. And, and the difference is really important. Um, what this really means is you're not going to catch a cold by uh, stepping into an elevator where a person with a cold had been. Because for the most part, the cold viruses cling to these respiratory droplets. They fall to the ground and, 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 and they're gone. Same thing with influenza. Uh, but with the aerosols, measles, uh, the virus can be airborne for a longer period of time. And that's where you see this widespread transmission. So the question is, COVID-19, the cor coronavirus, is it a droplet? Is it an aerosol? And it looks like it can be either one. It possibly can be either one. These uh, studies on, on this kind of phenomenon go way, way back. With tuberculosis back in 1934, a researcher named William Wells was trying to figure out uh, how tuberculosis was being uh, spread. And his conclusion was it was go so widespread because it was aerosolized. So with regard to coronavirus, what's the main method? It can be a virus. It can be a droplet. It can be an aerosol, but we have a way of sorting out which is the most important. And that will show us what we need to do. Okay. On the left, you've got a person who's going to em emit droplets and there are their friends all around them. But if they cough out a droplet, it might hit somebody or it might not. So uh, we can calculate how many people are going to get infected from one person with the disease. The person on the right does not have a droplet. The person on the right has got an aerosol, meaning a tiny little particle that can go widespread. And they've got friends too. So if it's aerosolized, you're going to spread it much more widely. So researchers try to look at which of these could it be. If it's an aerosolized virus, that means you're going to see if there's one person who's got it in a restaurant, in a business, uh, where it could be, you're going to see a lot of infected people around them. If it's a droplet, then you're going to see maybe one or two infected people around them. So um, what's the answer? How many people can one patient infect? Measles, aerosolized, 18. That's a big number. So if you've got one person in your family, who's got the measles virus, you can expect it to be expect it to be airborne. A lot of people are gonna catch it. With SARS-CoV-2, this is the COVID-19 virus, down to 2.5. So what does that mean? According to JAMA, that means that the balance of currently available evidence suggests that long range aerosolized based transmission is not the dominant mode of transmission. So, okay, so let me unshare here, come back to you. Um, here's what we're thinking this really means. What this means, is that for the most part, you're not in tremendous danger of going out for a walk and somebody on a bicycle going past you. That's not really it. Or even being in a large room with other people, the risk is not super high. Where you are at most risk is where we always thought you're at most risk, is being in fairly close proximity to other people. But either way, we want to be cautious. We do want to wear masks, not so much to protect you from others, but to protect others from you. And the new etiquette is you're wearing a mask to show your respect for other people. Um, so it, it blocks a virus that you may have. It drops the, the it, it stops the big droplets from going out. You do want to wash your hands because droplets can uh, arrive at surfaces and you can pick them up and you touch your eye, you touch your mouth um, and you can self inoculate that way. We do need social distancing as much as ever, but it, it looks like, although it's conceivable that air, airborne aerosolized viruses could theoretically affect the whole choir, um, that's much less likely to occur. So we still want to do all the things to protect ourselves, but um, but the, the old wisdom, the old wisdom as of about April still seems to be the one that applies. When it comes to close quarters here, I would imagine that masks are even of greater importance. We just heard what happened aboard that fishing vessel. 85 members out of a not even a 130 person crew came down with COVID-19. So let's go back to the elevator. I mean, if you're really within super close proximity of somebody, that then is when the mask is of ultra importance. 
Yeah, but, but it's probably not the person who got off the elevator five minutes ago who was a risk to you. It's not like they are aerosolizing it and staying in the elevator. Theoretically possible, but it doesn't seem to fit the epidemiology. The problem is the person who got on with you, who is coughing and sneezing and doesn't have a mask, that's just asking for it. The other thing, by the way, I got to tell you, Chuck, um, you know, we've talked about slaughterhouses because there you've got people it's like an elevator where you got people next to, you know, one person, another person next to them, another person next to them, except that it's an enormous room of people working hour after hour. Those droplets that they may be coughing out can not only infect the other workers, which is why we have tens of thousands of infected workers. And what was it as of last week, 148 deaths among the yeah. house workers, something like that. Um, but it also raises this continuing concern about the meat products. Uh, because the droplets fall onto whatever you're working on, and then in a refrigerated or frozen uh, surface, then they they remain viable for a long long period of time. So so that's the big concern there. Yeah, and obviously we saw what China did restricting imports, where they found that to be on I believe salmon and shrimp. They said no, it's no longer coming into the country after there was a an outbreak at a at a market tied back to that. So, uh, Doctor, yeah, salmon, shrimp. Uh, also pork. Um, so, and, and I think it's significant that China would do this um, for a couple of reasons. One is China has been in the game ever since the beginning. That's where it started. And China owns the Smithfield slaughterhouses. So if they don't want to eat that product, um, it, raise, it, it makes me wonder why we don't have more warnings about that here in, in this country. And again, uh, let's just talk right to the critics who say, well, you're talking about refrigerated <laughs> foods. You guys eat a lot of bagged salads who eat the plant-based diet. Couldn't you get it from that as well? Well, um, it's the, the things that really matter are, first of all, is the virus plentiful in the area where the thing is being produced? And then it, does it remain uh, refrigerated or frozen up until use? And so theoretically, anything can be infected. And everybody kind of wonders, I'm at the produce aisle. And I see the person in front of me picking up that Fuji apple and setting it back down. Those are all reasons for concern. However, um, the places where the virus is most common is within the slaughterhouses for whatever reason, the conditions people work under and the tremendously close proximity, which seems to be a little bit different compared with say an orchard or other produce uh, farms. The other thing about it is that once the apples or pears or oranges um, are picked, they may be kept cold or they may not be. Um, and in the store, they're typically not refrigerated and so at room temperature, the virus tends to not last very long. The, the differences are typically hours on a, on a room temperature surface to indefinite if it's refrigerated or frozen. All right, let's move on now. Time to open up the doctor's mailbag where we answer one of your questions. We're going to reach in here and see what we have for Dr. Barnard today. And Dr. Barnard, today's comes to us from a viewer on YouTube and actually lends itself quite well to what it is that I'll be talking with Susan Levin about momentarily. And that is that food is more important than ever. So with that in mind, the question is from a viewer who writes, my father has diabetes. His doctor did not agree with the whole food plant-based diet and he is taking medications. What should my father be doing in this case? Wow, well, first of all, um, thanks for your question and your father's lucky to have you looking out for him. Um, that's really great. Um, for whatever reason, um, the research on the effect of nutrition on type two diabetes has somehow not necessarily penetrated the public and even the medical community to a degree. Uh, but plant-based diets are the diets of choice for type 2 diabetes. And that's been true ever since the NIH funded our research team back in 2003 to come up with effect effectively what's the best possible diet for type 2 diabetes. And we did test the conventional diets. This may be what your doctor is pushing, uh, limiting carbohydrates, uh, not going too far with calories, that kind of thing. And if you do that, that's, that's a healthy diet. It will help some. However, when a person gets the animal products out of their diet completely, and they keep the oils to a bare minimum, something happens that doesn't happen with a conventional diet. And that's that the insulin resistance that's the basis for this disease starts to go away. 
And that's when people can do really well. Now, there's one thing you said that, that I did like is that it sounds like your father is, is taking the doctor's advice about medications. That's important because uh, even when your doctor does, uh, when your father does follow a healthy plant-based diet, which hopefully you will do under your guidance, um, the doctor needs to back your father off on his medications as the time goes by. And within a matter of days, if your father is on insulin, he's going to need to cut back. He's going to be delighted about that, you know, to not need so much insulin, but he's going to need to cut back because the diet is so powerful that it makes the, the uh, medications unnecessary to a degree and also can lead to overly low blood sugars if you don't back off. So the answer, um, doctors are good for monitoring. Doctors are good for pres prescribing medications. They're not always so hot for prescribing diets, but stick with the doctor um, and let the doc doctor ratchet back on the medications when the time comes and hopefully follow a healthy, low-fat, plant-based diet. You think in a case like this where the doctor really isn't overly familiar with nutrition, I mean, pardon the pun, but the proof will really be in the pudding if the patient does dramatically improve on this diet and the doctor's able to witness it. Well, yes. And, you know, this is this is not an unusual thing at all. There are lots and lots of patients who say, I like my doc, you know, in general, but the doctor doesn't really know much about nutrition and the doctor will freely admit that. So that's why here at Barnard Medical Center, patients will call up and they'll say, can I just have one hour with you um, or with one of our doctors or a nurse practitioner or one of our registered dietitians? And we'll talk through about how the diet works. And for, for skeptics, it's important also to provide information from research studies that show how it works. Then you got to make it practical. Here are the foods that you're going to want to eat. You put all that together, um, it makes a believer out of patients, families, and eventually their doctors too. We have the vast majority of doctors now understand this, uh, whether they're expert in it or not. Dr. Barn, I greatly appreciate it, my friend. Yeah. You bet. I'll stand by. All right, moving on. Even as the COVID-19 pandemic was just beginning earlier this year, it became became clear that the toll being taken on people with pre-existing medical conditions was far greater than the one being taken on otherwise healthy individuals. We're talking about people who had obesity, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, all of these conditions connected to a higher risk of COVID-19. And many of these conditions also completely preventable. A growing chorus of medical professionals are putting the blame for that squarely on the poor quality of the standard American diet and our fast food nation. And now that chorus is being amplified even louder. The message they are singing is that food is more important than ever. To discuss, we welcome dietitian Susan Levin to the exam room live. Susan, thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, thanks, Chuck. A couple of recent examples here uh, of this chorus, uh, the editor-in-chief of one of the most highly respected medical journals out there, BMJ, wrote an editorial last week with the headline, COVID-19, What We Eat Matters All the More Now. We're talking about the editor-in-chief of one of the most respected medical journals out there. I think to me, that speaks volumes. Yeah, and it's funny where you and Dr. Barnard just wrapped up talking about diabetes. She, in her, in her editorial, um, mentioned specifically on the upside how the medical world is embracing this, this concept that a, a nutrition medicine uh -oh. and to at least refer their patients to someone who knows a good deal about nutrition. But secondly, she highlights specific sort of acknowledging now we know that diabetes is not something that you necessarily just manage. You can actually reverse it. So I, I really appreciated her acknowledgement that this is now considered a disease worth addressing as something you can reverse. And that's, you know, that has been Dr. Barnard and PCRM's rally cry for decades since embarking upon its own research with reversing <laughs> type 2 diabetes with diet. So I, I really appreciated that she kind of started out with that um, huge observation. And a lot of, again, a lot of physicians don't even know, they still treat diabetes like, um, let's just keep it, the progression as slow as possible. But she, again, we know that this, this is something that a lot of people can come back from. 
Exactly. And I think that it's also important to note that the doctors who read BMJ, they are not just limited to the preventative medicine community who believes very heavily in a plant-based diet. These go out to all the doctors. You know, there's a very good chance that your doctor has access to this, which means that they then will have the opportunity to get this information, exactly what it was that Dr. Barnard and I were just talking about. But it, it doesn't stop there, Susan, because also over the weekend, the editorial board for the Boston Globe wrote about the new dietary guidelines that you and I have discussed, the same ones that are under review right now, saying the scientists who worked on a report that these guidelines will be based off of. Well, the editorial board pointed out, quote, that their work was not just happening amid the coronavirus pandemic, but is also inextricably linked to it. Again, we're talking about diet related chronic disease and how mm -hmm. everything now is just colliding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, again, I'll. These, everything is really colliding. I, I'm even kind of today um, reminded of, of, of reports that talk about the sustainability of, of food and how that works. <laughs> that also works with the health of Americans and now the conversation around immunity and COVID. Um, but yes, there, that editorial does link to the Dietary Guidelines uh, Advisory Committee scientific report, which mentions that they, they a little bit kicked the can, although their, their hands were tied. They weren't really allowed to talk about uh, or look into topics that weren't specifically assigned to them. But they said the next committee really needs to think about um, how diet relates to immunity, especially in today's environment and what we know. And is COVID-19 really going to be the last um uh, coronavirus that we experience, the last pandemic, I doubt it. So let's start talking about how we can protect people now from the next one. Um, but the going back to the BMJ editor in chief's uh, text, where she also acknowledges that, you know, yes, we need to address the underlying issues that address directly address a the severity of COVID and how people respond to COVID, but B, the severity of what ultimately will be the second wave uh, of this disease and how obesity is not only the underlying condition for diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and she talks about depression as well, but also COVID-19. So, so we need to start having that conversation in terms of getting people to a healthy weight that addresses certainly the underlying, underlying condition behind what can really lead people down a pretty bleak path if or if and when they are diagnosed with COVID-19. So the committee recognizes that the, for the dietary guidelines. Um, this journal is recognizing this. The editorial you mentioned is recognizing this. Like this really has to be the topic of conversation in order to protect people down the road. Strictly a hypothesis here, because it's it's just impossible to answer this question as a fact. But if more people were eating uh, less red meat, certainly less processed meat, uh, way far uh, way far less uh, processed foods in general, and instead eating more whole fruits, whole vegetables, whole grains, down the list. Do you think then we would still be seeing instances in Florida where they're at max capacity? for ICU beds. Again, strictly, strictly a hypothetical here, but if everybody is kind of able-bodied going into this thing, mm -hmm. would we be seeing the severity of COVID-19 that we are today? Well, I think that's the argument that, um, that again, the, the editor-in-chief of, of the British Medical Journal is making, and she's saying, no, if people were um, starting at a, at a healthier baseline, then that might not prevent you from getting the virus, but the severity, once you get it, and presumably the severity is what's gonna dictate if you go to the hospital, how long you're in the hospital. Do you need to be on a respirator? Will you get out of the hospital? So I would say um, it's, it's not necessarily hypothetical. I think she's saying it. So I feel comfortable that there's enough research to back that up. And I, I think another interesting point she makes that doesn't even, that that's more about the um, who, who do we hold, whom do we hold accountable to, the, to all of this? And it's, it's certainly in a lot of people's hands responsibility, 
but she specifically points out the meat industry and meat processing plants, not because of the reasons that we all know, which is the people who actually work in those conditions are being exposed to um, just horrible situations and are, are getting infected with this virus at rates that are just unimaginable. But she's saying actually that the meat industry itself is responsible for an obesogenic society that their promotion of products like red meat, processed meat is what is leading to people to be so overweight and sick and ultimately the severity of COVID-19. So I thought that was an interesting um, um, conversation as well. Not only is meat packing uh, filthy and horrible for the people in there, but it is what is setting up people to be sick from um, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, depression. And now we know um, poor outcomes for COVID-19. And that segues into my final point really quickly is that she also cited um, that people uh, who were older uh, were at higher risk, but also uh, minorities were at a higher risk. And that opens up that conversation that we've had on the show as well, that you know, in underprivileged communities, where there may not be access to the high quality food that would help keep you healthy, your only options are these unhealthy ones. That then plays a significant part, perhaps, in what is fueling all of these COVID cases among minorities. Yeah, so you're really, you know, you get down to some deep, deep, but but vast roots and thus the word systemic, right? Like this is a huge problem and we need to, this isn't something we're gonna fix tomorrow. But this is something that we need to start moving towards so that we can get down to the roots of systemic racism, disproportionate health care. I mean, it just it is it is it's so interesting how this pandemic has really shined a light on the gruesomeness, if you will, of society and just how we have a lot of work to do. Like we have a lot of work to do right on almost every level. So um it's it's good to be reminded that uh, we need to forge ahead and and do what we can. And at and at PCRM at Barnard Medical Center, we're doing that by fighting things that we are the experts in. Right, we are the experts in getting you to a healthy baseline, um, regardless of where you are. If you already have heart disease, diabetes. If you're overweight or obese, let's get you at the primary point so that we can deal um, and, and we'll do work in any way we can to help you get to that place and whatever situation you find yourself, um, we will figure it out so that we can be set up for, you can be set up for success. We can all, the whole country, the whole world, right? That's how you fix a pandemic. Um, and we'll do it one person at a time. All right, Susan Levin, thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you, Chuck. All right. Now, if you are ready to make the change, if you want to be one of those one person at a time, you can take control of your health right now. You can actually schedule an appointment to meet with Susan at the Barnard Medical Center. Certainly all of the doctors and dietitians there really understand nutrition, putting a premium on treating the root cause of these chronic illnesses and not just treating the symptoms. So important. And so if you would like to make an appointment right now, you can do that via telemedicine, don't even have to leave the comfort of your own home. You see the web address right there, barnardmedical.org, or pick up the phone, call 202-527-7500. And the big news is Dr. Barnard broke on the show here on Friday is that if you live in Florida, you can now see our doctors and dietitians at the Barnard Medical Center. So important right now, especially given the coronavirus pandemic, Florida, now the epicenter. Why not seize this opportunity to take control of your health? So barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500. Also available in California, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Massachusetts, Colorado, Kentucky, and Arizona. All of those states, if you live there, you can make that appointment today and take charge of your health. And also don't forget to subscribe to the Exam Room podcast by the Physicians Committee, kind of our sister show here, the one that launched everything. You can get that wherever shows are available on Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher. Really, we take what we talk about here and then dive in on a much deeper level. We have three years worth of content there for you to really listen to and, and become inspired by and enlightened by. It's such a great podcast. So check that out. 
Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever shows are available, and hit that subscribe button. And please also leave a five star rating. Before we go, I would like to wish my lovely wife, the love of my life, a very happy birthday. Happy birthday, Julie. I love you. I will see you soon. And thanks again to the crew that makes this show possible, our director, Emily Cologne, and our producers, Laura Anderson and Donna Steele. On behalf of Dr. Neil Barnard and dietitian Susan Levin and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Until tomorrow, please remember to take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based.